Hello, this is Scott Hoy. And I'm Kyle Miller. Today's episode of the Psychology Talk podcast is from the vaults. We've handpicked some of our favorite and most popular episodes to share with more listeners. Since we started this podcast, we've been on a mission to better inform clinicians and consumers on topics in mental health. We strive to reduce myths and misconceptions and enlighten you beyond the many memes or sound bites that try to sell you on ways to better your life. So without further ado, here's an episode from the archives to do just that. So please do your part and take a moment to subscribe, like, and leave a review for us at Apple Podcasts, Spreaker, or wherever you're listening in from. That would help us to continue our mission at the Psychology Talk Podcast. I think patients, on average, are more interested in what they can do to help their own um, well-being. Um, early on, I sometimes found a lot of resistance to self-regulation-oriented approaches. Uh, why I'm, I think if, my, if I just wait, my doctor will find the right treatment and I'll get better. And I think it's terribly important when we can shift the emphasis to what can I do that will help me get better. And that's not to say that there aren't medical treatments that might be relevant and sometimes essential. Uh, when my wife got a serious uh, uterine cancer, I wanted her into the best, best oncologist um, for that area as soon as possible. Um, on, the, on the other hand, long term, um, whether you have diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease, your well-being is going to depend a great deal more on your lifestyle choices than it will on the treatment you're getting. So the, the treatment will help, but over time we can make bigger changes. Hello, this is Dr. Scott Hoy. Today my guest is Dr. Don Moss. Dr. Moss is the Dean of the College of Integrative Medicine and Health Sciences at Saybrook University in Pasadena, California. He discusses the Pathways Model of Integrative Healing. He is the author, along with Dr. Angel McGrady, of two books on this model, Pathways to Illness, Pathways to Health, and Integrative Pathways. Dr. Moss discusses this model of integrative lifestyle changes that are combined with psychological treatments, physical therapy, occupational therapy, nursing, and complementary and alternative medicine. He goes into a great deal of material about how this model unfolds in treatment and provides inspiring case studies. And now, here's the interview. Welcome to the podcast. Today, my guest is Dr. Don Moss. Dr. Moss is the Dean of the College of Integrative Medicine and Health Sciences at Saitbrook University in Oakland, California. There, he has built training programs in biofeedback, clinical hypnosis, integrative mental health, wellness coaching, and integrative functional nutrition. Dr. Moss has served in leadership positions for professional societies in biofeedback and hypnosis. He is also the author of numerous scholarly books and articles in the field of psychology, biofeedback, and hypnosis. Today, he is here to discuss the Pathways Model of Integrative Healing. He is the co-author with Dr. Angel McGrady of two books on this model, Pathways to Healing, Pathways to Health, and Integrative Pathways. Uh, so thank you so much for taking the time out and coming to the show, Dr. Moss. Well, thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Okay. Well, maybe you can, you can uh, feel free to just kind of describe how the book came about and the Pathways model came about. Thank you. Um, I have known Angel McGrady for about 25 years. Uh, she's a researcher in the field of psychophysiology, having conducted extensive research on physiological interventions with diabetes. Um, and she's also a counselor. So she has a practical interest in helping individual human beings make changes. She's also involved in graduate medical education, especially working with building resilience in medical students and uh, residents. So she and I began conversing in 2009 about a, a book that would 
focus on integrating personal behavioral changes, lifestyle changes with medical and psychological treatment. And we began to call it the pathways model because what we're interested in is the fact that there is a pathway that leads to illness. That pathway involves a lot of bad choices behaviorally, bad choices nutritionally, um, lack of activity, lack of physical exercise, um, just a variety of lifestyle choices that we make, each of those choices made without a great deal of thought, but they begin to add up over time. And many of the illnesses that plague people today, especially uh, heart disease and related conditions, are tremendously affected by our, our lifestyle choices and behavioral choices. So we were interested if we highlighted this with individual patients and highlighted reversing some of these bad choices, uh, making introducing new behaviors, new health-supporting behaviors, new lifestyle choices, would we be able to persuade people to make a difference that actually impacted on their health? Uh, we began to converse about this in 2009, and, and we developed a framework for the Pathways model, which spelled out three levels of change. Now, the first level was really an emphasis of Dr. McGrady. Uh, she is a physiologist, and what she was interested in is that many of our poorly chosen lifestyle uh, patterns affect our normal body rhythms in negative ways. So if we could help patients to make some positive changes, could we help them improve or restore normal body rhythms, everything from eating patterns to sleep? So we were interested in small steps that, that a person might actually follow through on, um, and in particular, uh, things that they could direct themselves so that we as psychologists, as uh, counselors could intervene, but a health coach could make the same kinds of interventions. So that's level one, self-directed behavioral changes. Level two, we were interested in using resources that are available. Our society today is full of community-based classes, church-sponsored classes in uh, exercise, uh, mindfulness, mindfulness, um, breath training, relaxation skills. And then we have an incredible variety of online resources. It used to be CDs and um, self-help books. Today, it's more likely to be an app on the phone or a program that you download and participate in on the phone, on a tablet or on your computer. So we have all of these community-based resources and available online resources. And could we steer people to make choices to use some of these on a regular basis? So that's level two, making lifestyle changes supported by resources in the community and online resources. Level three is to integrate this with well-chosen professional interventions. And the professional interventions include their mainstream medicine. It may include their behavioral health professional, a social worker, psychologist, counselor. But it also includes people like um, CAM therapists, complementary and alternative medicine therapists, uh, spiritual advisors, pastors, uh, the kinds of people that help people uh, with alternative approaches to health, very different from what they're getting at the doctor's office. So that's level three. And we were interested, um, I personally had experienced that if my patients could make small changes that were successful and that they felt were making a difference, we call that self-efficacy. If my patients could do something that helped them, they were more likely to take the next step. So we wanted to build this pathways model stepwise so that people could slowly accumulate confidence in themselves that they could actually make big differences in their health because they'd made some small steps. So that was the basic framework of the pathways model. And and in that basic framework, I mean it's it's very it's very open um, in in a sense that you can kind of I guess plug in those areas as you go along, right? But it's uh, it's stepwise in the sense that it seems like more um, 
specific things like like you said the working on reestablishing normal rhythms and then showing some kind of efficacy there correct and then and then more uh, intense or m- more uh, difficult skills building right and then showing again efficacy there and then moving on to like that deeper level of psychotherapy or hypnosis or bio- biofeedback or deeper work with guided imagery is it, is that kind of what you're looking for? You're looking for a benchmark of of some kind of uh, self efficacy, and then moving on and adding on to the to the interventions. Yes. Okay. Um, and and Jill McGrady and I are working right now on a workbook for patients. Um, I wish we were making faster progress because we really believe that a, a patient could begin their own pathways model progress. Um, with simply a little uh, written guidance and online uh, resources. Uh, but right now, um, when, we, when we provide our own case histories, most of the patients either begin with a counselor, psychologist, or health coach to help them make some choices and then implement them on their own with intermittent contact with the therapist or coach. And then over time, we begin to bring in the professional interventions after people are already making progress and gaining confidence in the the possibility of change. Okay. And so um, has has this been rolled out at a particular clinic? Um, I mean, you mentioned Toledo. but Is is this within your own private practice or within Dr. McGrady's practice or in a clinic or... um, because you mentioned working with that, that level one of establishing yes. norms, those could be anywhere from like uh, like uh, a yoga instructor, right, or a nu- nutritional uh, education counselor, things like that. Uh, maybe Pilates, or even like uh, Feldenkrais, like movement Tai Chi. That's right. Yeah. But, but um, like, for instance, if, if I, as a psychologist or somebody uh, else in the behavioral health field, wanting to, to use the model and incorporate that, would they be getting the referral at level one from someone else for, uh, say, for instance, deeper mind-body techniques, complementary uh, and integrative medicine, or and then moving on to psychotherapy or our and hypnosis? Model, yeah, our mm-hmm. model is that, that it's helpful if there is a professional of some kind, whether it's a health coach or a counselor or psychologist, social worker, or a nurse, uh, coordinating the process with the patient, helping the patient continue to make good choices, building what we call an, an alliance for health, as, as a health coach will, with the patient, and then helping the patient make their own choices. Now, the case studies that we included in the two books largely come from my practice and Angel's practice. Um, I had a, uh, a four-clinic practice in West Michigan um, called the Psychological Services Center, and over 30 years, um, we utilized a lot of community resources. We had nutritional counselors in the clinic at times. At other times, we had massage therapists. We brought in as many um, allied health uh, professionals as we could involve. And then I also worked with health coaches in the community um, who began to make referrals to me that fit in with the Pathways model. Oh, okay, okay. So this kind of, uh, it, it sounds like it, it organically developed from um, your experience in your practice and her practice. That's right. Yeah, okay. Probably Probably 30 years ago, I wrote a book for um, the National Biofeedback Association, uh, part of an educational package they were developing on adjunctive techniques. And I've always been big on helping my patients make goals um, because I found, for example, if they would sign up for a yoga class early in their treatment with me, they were more likely to continue to benefit when they were done with me because they would continue in that yoga class. And if I had helped them with muscular relaxation, uh, autonomic nervous system uh, relaxation uh, through biofeedback and hypnosis, um, they were likely to sustain those states because they were continuing to to meditate or to do yoga or uh, some people are more physically oriented more um, exercise bicycling walking but if if the patient were continuing some activity on a regular basis that didn't depend on the professional the benefit of the professional intervention lasted longer Uh, okay okay sort of a synergistic effect that's right okay um 
I also learned on the negative side. Um, I have practiced since the late 1970s in a gorgeous part of the country. I live in West Michigan along the Lake Michigan shore, um, and we have miles and miles of beaches that I can walk. We have boardwalks where people who have less mobility can walk, uh, even with a walker if they need to, or a cane. Uh, We have beautiful places to sit and enjoy the sunset. Um, And yet early on in my professional career, I worked in some community uh, health and mental health clinics, and I repeatedly met patients who didn't know where the beach was, didn't know the way to the lakeshore, didn't know the way to the many parks, hadn't been in the neighboring community because they heard there was a bridge in between that got stuck once or several times. So they were so limited in their everyday scope of living. And I began to recognize, okay, why are these people seeing me? Well, they're seeing me because they live in a small box and that's depressing. It's discouraging. Um, it leads to sedentary lifestyle. Uh, so yes, they some of them had diagnosable medical conditions, chronic illnesses. Some of them had diagnosable uh, mental health disorders, but they also had lifestyle disorders based on a lack of scope of life. So I, I began to realize if we can help people lift up their eyes so they're not looking at the floor in front of them, uh, which quite literally some of my depressed patients sat and stared at the floor all day, if they could see the sunset, if they could see the forest, if they could see the sand dunes, um, it made a difference. It made a difference in mood. It made a difference in hopefulness and in what I mentioned earlier, self-efficacy, believing I can do something and it'll make a difference. Yeah, just the, those little steps that can add up to bigger steps over time can be very helpful. Um, yeah, so so all in all, just a sense of hope and and um, like you said, self-efficacy. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, um, I, the difference. Maybe we can talk a little bit about the difference between integrated pathways and uh, pathways to healing. Right. Um, the difference between the two books, and, and I think what I noticed was uh, it seemed like there was more of an explicit um, rolling out of the of the and, and integration of uh, the complementary and integrative medicine. So maybe you could talk a little yes. bit about what that is and specifically why it was rolled out more in, in the second book, which came out in 2018 versus the 2013 one. Um, Actually, late in the writing of the 2013 book, Angel and I both recognized um, I had I had been a real advocate of helping people with their spirituality, reawakening their spirituality. Mm -hmm. And I actually um, organized a national meeting called Circle of the Soul, um, the connection between spirituality and health. Uh, And Angel was involved in leadership in the organization with me. and we started saying, geez, uh, the, spirit, the spirit is hardly evident in this book, in this first Pathways book. And then we started getting some teasing by colleagues, and they said, oh, all your patients get better in Pathways. Everybody improves. That's, that's not realistic. Well, it's true that m- m- uh, many authors tend to write about their most successful stories because yeah. we feel a sense of satisfaction and pride in how well some of our patients have done. But we took those two um, ideas, and then we thought the third one was, as you noticed, complementary therapies, alternative therapies. Um, Both Angel and I were recognizing that our patients were using a variety of complementary therapies, things that were outside the mainstream of medicine and yet which were beneficial. So we thought, let's do another book. And number one, let's emphasize those people who are probably not going to get better, people who have chronic conditions, who will have relapses um, no matter what you do, because there, there, it certainly is true. If I'm helping a patient with a, a very serious cancer, um, they can do the very best things possible in their lifestyle to enhance their immune function, and yet they will have occasionally a relapse, and sometimes they will even die. Um, so we decided let's let's focus on some chronic conditions, people with recurring, relapsing, or continuing conditions. Uh, let's let's emphasize more the spiritual needs and the spiritual 
um, deficits in the patients, helping patients rediscover their spirituality, because this was something we both did in our practices. And then let's emphasize more of the integration of complementary therapies into the treatment. Now, I, I had personally had a number of very positive experiences with complementary therapists. Um, I did publish a case study of a nurse with lupus. And that particular patient, at one point, she had a lot of pain that accompanied times in which her joints were swelling. Uh, so I referred her to a physician, an osteopathic physician that I knew did acupuncture. What I didn't know is, you know, you might call acupuncture a a complementary therapy, although it's working its way now fully into the mainstream. But what I didn't know was that this same doctor was also trained in functional nutrition. And he actually did almost no acupuncture, but he um, did a functional nutrition evaluation, looked at nutritional deficits, um, recommended some nutritional changes. Uh, we did a number of other self-regulation-oriented interventions with her, but she actually felt that she benefited the most from the nutrition, which wasn't even part of my treatment plan. It happened because I made a referral to a complementary therapist colleague. Um, and I've had that same experience over and over again. We can't entirely know what's going to benefit our patients. So, Ideally, it's wonderful when we can work in an integrative setting and we have a variety of practitioners under one roof. But if we don't have that luxury, we can at least network with the practitioners available in our community, whether they're yoga teachers or Feldenkrais therapists, uh, HANA somatics therapists, nutritionists. Um, we can make referrals and invite our patients to benefit from a variety of interventions um, because my practical experience is one of these interventions may make a huge difference more than any of the others, and it may not be the one that I think is going to benefit the patient the most. Okay, and, and also there's a way for you to help the patient kind of, it seems, be more cognizant of the effect of one or the other and to be the kind of mediator for them or help them to figure out which is working better or, or less than probably, right? Yes. Yeah. Now, one of the things that I've noticed is quite interesting. Um, the things that are most utilized are not necessarily the complementary and alternative therapies that are the most effective according to the scientific research. So patients don't always make good choices, but we can at least inform them what we know of the literature and say that, look, um, with your type of disorder, a lot of patients who have um, chemotherapy-related nausea will benefit from acupuncture. So we can, we can guide them to what the scientific research says is most likely to help them. On the other hand, we know there's there's probably a huge element of placebo involved in many of the, the complementary therapies as well as in mainstream therapy. So, yeah, so if, if, I, if my patient wants to seek out something that I'm skeptical of, I might say, I think I know another approach, another form of treatment that there's more evidence about. But if the patient persists because one of their best friends has done wonderfully with magnets, I'm not going to tell them don't do it. Um, <laughs> right. And I've seen yeah. people I've seen people make enormous um, gains with a variety of complementary therapy therapies that I'm dubious about, but they're still doing better. Um, in fact, sometimes uh, between the the evidence based interventions we make and the less evidence supported interventions, I've had chronic uh, chronic patients with chronic illness who actually look like they're cured. The lupus patient that I mentioned earlier, actually, um, by the time she'd done a variety of interventions, um, she no longer tested um, to have high ANA um, anti-nuclear antibodies in her blood bloodstream. That's and her, pretty and, amazing. Yeah, yeah. And what's interesting is her physician was greatly impressed, told her to keep doing what she was doing, told me that either it was a placebo 
or she didn't really have lupus <laughs> because clearly lupus couldn't possibly benefit from all of these complementary therapies. Well, I've come to believe that, in fact, even serious uh, chronic illnesses with a strong um, medical component, including genetic disposition, these things, sometimes people do sometimes get completely better, or at least they can get better for a long time. So I, I firmly believe in, in um, synergy, um, letting people seek out some of their own choices, but also guiding them wherever possible to um, more than one form of intervention integrated okay. with good mainstream medical care. So under the umbrella of the pathways model, one becomes more of a guide. That's right. And even uh, helping to make, make healthy choices, not just uh, like nutritionally, but also just make uh, concerted efforts to do something different and see what works for that individual. That's right. It seems, seems a bit, um, uh, 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 what's, what's the word? What's, what's the old Erickson adage? Uh, it's escaping me right now. Utilization. The utilization or, method, yeah. It yes. seems, like, it seems like it's highly, highly, there you go. And my, my anomia was getting the best of me today in the afternoon. Um, yeah, so it seems highly based on let's work with, let's see what works for the patient and meet them at their level. Yeah. That's um, right. Yeah. And, and we're working with the whole person here. We're recognizing, um, I had a patient who came to, this was before I was explicitly using a Pathways framework, mm -hmm. but I was running a, um, a pain management program in a, in a local hospital, um, and we were doing quite a variety of behavioral changes, skill building, um, biofeedback skills, physical relaxation training, uh, mm -hmm. self-hypnosis. Um, and one patient, um, elderly woman with very serious pain, came twice and then dropped out. And I thought, oh, that's too bad. I tried to call her, couldn't reach her. Um, and I just accepted she dropped out and maybe this wasn't the right intervention for her. And then the following Christmas, I started getting Christmas cards from her, which continued for about eight years. Hmm. And it turned out that one of our two interventions that she was present for, we talked about social supports. And each of the members of the class was invited to make a goal, um, something related to increasing or improving their social supports. And she decided to recontact a sister that she had not been in touch with for quite some time. Hmm. And she did. And it actually led to she and the sister connecting with another sibling and spending time. And her pain remitted. Her pain moderated, at least, and at times remitted. Mm, and in fact, okay. she was sending me Christmas cards because the treatment was quite successful. Now, we had thought social supports are important, but it's a small part of the treatment. For her, it was the whole treatment. We couldn't know that, um, but that's the, way, that's the way human life is we, and human health are. We don't know the intervention that's going to make the, the largest difference. Yeah, I, I think that I'm all, I often wonder when patients leave for whatever reason um, and they contact me. I mean, sometimes they do contact us, sometimes they don't. Um, there, there's always the old... Um, the old uh, bit of statistical knowledge that you know the average number of sessions is four to six, um, uh, and and most people have some kind of uh, relief, and that's why they stop coming. They kind of think of it, think of psychotherapy, for instance, as as more uh, along the lines of framing it as like a, going to the doctor for a broken arm. Once your arm is broken, you don't go for that particular problem anymore. And I always wonder how many people actually get better. And just stop coming in because it's an inconvenience to make that extra hour out of your your, your week, yeah. so to speak. Yeah, but that's well, that's a really nice a, that's that's a compliment to you. Uh, it is. Uh, yeah. And there's an old concept uh, which comes out of the um, uh, research on perception, a concept of the just noticeable difference. Mm. And it's interesting to me how often if patients make a substantial change, they may still be suffering pain or they may still be suffering their irritable bowel symptoms. But if they're encouraged by that improvement, they may not choose um, for all the reasons you just mentioned. It's, it's difficult to get, to get to sessions. You have to pay for it. You have to arrange your 
insurance, uh, they may choose to be happy with the result. If they're 30% improved or 40% improved, their life may be much more rewarding and satisfying. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's, it's in, in one of those areas where we just can't uh, necessarily uh, uh, gauge it, you know, have some data for it as clinicians. But uh, hopefully more of those happen than not. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, well, there's a couple things I wanted to ask you about within within uh, the, the the two books. In in um, your 2013 book, there was a passage at the beginning that talked about uh, how the the pathways model challenges the assumption that the average North American makes about health. In other words, that blood pressure. I think the the passage talks about blood hypertension. Uh, going up constantly right and that's right right and that in other societies such as Botswana New Guinea the Solomon Islands Asia the places where they don't actually inc- in, uh, provide sodium into their diets right that um they don't experience it in fact they have sometimes lower than what we would consider to be the average uh blood pressure level. Has that changed at all since 2013? Have you noticed any difference um, within the mindset of the kind of medical model, the allopathic models of of treatment uh, rather than uh, preventative methods? Well, I think patients on average are more interested in what they can do to help their own um, Mm -hmm. well-being. Early on, I sometimes found a lot of resistance to self-regulation oriented approaches. Uh, why I'm, I think if, my, if I just wait, my doctor will find the right treatment and I'll get better. And I think it's terribly important when we can shift the emphasis to what can I do that will help me get better. And that's not to say that there aren't medical treatments that might be relevant and sometimes essential. Uh, when my wife got a serious uh, uterine cancer, I wanted her into the best best oncologist um, for that area as soon as possible. Um, on, the, on the other hand, long term, um, whether you have diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease, your well-being is going to depend a great deal more on your lifestyle choices than it will on the treatment you're getting. So the, the treatment will help. But over time, we can make bigger changes. Um, there, I, you mentioned uh, this inter, international data, uh, how much salt is in the diet. There was something else I saw, and it was older data. When refrigeration actually became available in the average household, there was a huge drop in blood pressure. Now, it wasn't as low as those countries that have very little salt in their diet, but it was because up till then, almost all food was salted to, to preserve, to preserve it. it. Ah, okay. You don't have a refrigerator in the kitchen to keep things cold, so you salt your meat, you salt your vegetables. You just Salt was used in a variety of ways to make food, not only um, to preserve it, but even to make it palatable. Oh, so wow. when, okay. when refrigeration was introduced... Americans' blood pressure got better. Huh. But again, we still have a tremendous amount of salt, especially in prepared foods. And we use so many prepared foods and fast foods, uh, which are high sodium. Now, I hope that with the greater awareness of consumers, um, that will slowly change. Uh, but again, there are lots of factors. Uh, socioeconomics come into play. Uh, we have what are called food deserts where people can't get, get healthy food. Um, so I think we, we really want to provide better um, integrative health approaches for all elements of our community, not just the affluent, edu- most educated people. We want to help the average person. Right. One of our, uh, yeah, one, one of our graduate students at Saybrook University where I'm, I am uh, employed uh, did a master's thesis um, she called it superfoods for super kids. She'd been noticing for a long time that the food banks had a pretty pretty unhealthy food. It was donated and they got what they got. Well, she became involved in a project to persuade um, supermarkets, uh, food retailer, food wholesalers rather, to donate more healthy food into the food banks. And then she also organized an educational program for school children. 
educating them about what difference healthier food would make in their their health and well-being and in their family's well-being. Um, and it made a difference. She ended up employed by the uh, county in San Diego uh, because um, the, the county embraced this project. And I think we need we need more projects like that to reach all elements of the community. Yeah, I know that the the book goes quite a bit into those food deserts and talking about that as a huge component uh, of health. Just uh, just the ability to feed oneself nutritional food in a proper way, uh, and that being the kind of first gateway in the the level one. Um, I, I think that's that's very important. I was in, I was in, I was in, overall I was impressed by the amount of research that the two of you put into the book, and uh, also the uh, the the pathway, if you will, between that research and how to unroll the interventions, the integration of interventions uh, with the case studies. Um, I think. Uh, Maybe we could talk about some of the case studies. You did mention um, the nurse with lupus. That was probably in a different, uh, that was actually written up, right? Yes, that was in the Integrated Pathways book. Okay, right, okay. And there was also, I mean, there's a a host of them. There is the uh, subacute presentation uh, with study, uh, case study of Janice. There was uh, chronic headaches with Doreen. I thought uh, doing a lot of pain management in my practice, that was very informative and... um, uh, I don't know, maybe if there's anything in, in particular about the case studies you would like to talk about, you could, you could one, one or two of them maybe, or. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, I, I've already mentioned the nurse with lupus a couple mm-hmm. of times, so I'm going to go back to her, mm-hmm. uh, because for me, that's an example of, um, the kinds of interventions you do with a person. Um, okay. and first of all, I want to say both Angela and I firmly believe we have to allow the patient's choices to emerge from a dialogue uh, that's heavily directed by the patient. Which because is a utilization can, kind of, yeah. yeah. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I know that smoking, uh, stopping smoking, improving sleep, increasing aerobic activity, moderating alcohol, making better food choices, and managing stress. I know if you do those things, it'll make a huge difference. But we've known that for 30 years, and it hasn't made enough difference. Correct. So I think we have to meet the patient where they are. Mm-hmm. Um, in the book, we use um, Prochaska's model, the readiness for change model. Mm-hmm. And I think if my patient isn't ready for change and I try to lead them in a direction that they're not ready to go, it's going to make no difference. Uh, they're mm-hmm. going to write me off, and they're not going to feel a heavy sense of involvement with the goal. Mm -hmm. But again, going back to this particular nurse with lupus, um, we started very small at level one. She made an initial goal to walk for five minutes on a boardwalk near her home. Mm -hmm. Um, And then she would walk back home again. She wanted to also walk her own dog. She'd actually been paying a neighbor kid to walk her dog. And she decided she would take back walking the dog. So that's small. But it, she actually was surprised at how much she enjoyed uh, this activity. Go well, she, she also kept a sleep log uh, because her sleep was bothering her, and she had terrible sleep. She, it took her forever to fall asleep. She had very chaotic sleep times. Uh, she actually was running a small business in her um, bedroom right out of the bed, and um, she did, we talked to her about Uh, stimulus control and sleep hygiene. In other words, what can you do to your surroundings? What can you do to your habits that will actually lead you to to, uh, be able to fall asleep and enjoy sleep in a more gratifying way? Um, So she actually agreed to limit the Red Bull she was drinking. Um, She agreed to get things out of the bedroom like the TV and her laptop computer. Um, she She talked to her boss about reducing the rotating shifts uh, she didn't wasn't completely able to do that, but she was able to sleep a little more regularly, which really helped. Um, and then she really had wanted to do weight loss. Well, I'm I'm terribly apprehensive always about choosing weight loss as a first goal because it's such a frustrating area that people often don't succeed in, and then they give up. 
Mm-hmm. So in her case, what I decided to do was um, simply focus on mindful eating, that we would encourage her to savor the foods she ate and teach her how to do that, teach her a little bit of mindfulness, enjoying the the sensations of the foods, the, the textures of the food, the flavors, um, how they looked, and to choose foods that were more attractive to look at and to, and to eat. Um, well, she made a lot of progress. She actually extended her walks from five minutes to 15 minutes. Um, she found that she actually enjoyed the um, the mindful eating, although she um, she kind of spoofed me um, and my clinic staff because she wrote a little journal entry about mindfully eating a double Whopper. So um, the double wa- <laughs> she mindfully savored the textures of the double Whopper. But she got the idea. And she actually was was feeling pretty positive about making some changes. Her sleep onset was a little better, although she almost she um, almost got uh, reprimanded at work because with reduced caffeine, she almost fell asleep completely on the job as a nurse. <laughs> That's not well, a good thing to do. No, yeah. no, not when you're a nurse responsible for medications. No. So then we moved on to level two because she said, "I'm I'm ready for more." And we decided, I decided um, to suggest aqua therapy or uh, gentle yoga, something that would involve physical activity that would probably not aggravate her swollen joints. Mm -hmm. So she chose aqua therapy. Um, When you do aqua therapy, you're in a pool that's in the 90 degrees somewhere. Um, You're buoyant, so you don't have as much impact on your joints. And the warm water is very soothing to the joints. So you can engage in a little more activity, still has to be gentle, but you can do more activity with less pain. So she decided to try that. At that time, we also had a hospital-sponsored illness self-management support group. Well, her physician had originally said when he made the referral, he said, I want her treated for depression, but see if you can help her become more involved in managing her own condition. Well, when I knew that there was a hospital-based illness self-management group, I thought, this is perfect. Well, the um, nurse running this group uh, used a um, uh, a lupus uh, self-care guide that came out of NIH, um, and it involved a lot of things like becoming aware of medication side effects. Well, this patient was a nurse. She understood medicine. And when she started actually looking at how many of her medications had side effects and interactions with each other, she was horrified because this had been her primary emphasis was my doctor giving me the right medicine. So she decided wherever possible to begin to reduce medicines um, to reduce side effects. Um, She also um, had really enjoyed the mindful eating, so she did a mindfulness class uh, that was available at a local church. So we've got several um, things with community support um, which are helpful to her. The aqua therapy, the, um, uh, the, the self-management group, and the mindfulness class. And she did mm-hmm. very well with these things. If anything, I began to be concerned because she started reducing some of her uh, core lupus medications um, her phys- I, I at least insisted she she not do that until she talked with her physician about it. Her physician didn't like it, uh, but he he at least guided her uh, to do the titration of the medicines in a way that would be less harmful. So that was positive. Then we went on to do uh, some professional interventions. I did hypnosis. I made the referral to the uh, osteopathic physician who ended up doing nutrition. And eventually I sent her to a uh, behavioral sleep medicine clinic um, at the University of Michigan, which did a lot of nice online work with patients since she was about three hours away from their clinic. She had to go there for mm-hmm. her evaluation, but they followed up with her beautifully at a distance. And she did very well with these professional interventions. Um, ultimately, she eliminated her lupus medicines, and as I mentioned, her blood work was normal. She had some times when she had a flare of um, pain, uh, when either activity or her menstrual cycle, 
uh, or stress in her life seemed to produce a flare of pain, and then she would have more symptoms. But she used self-hypnosis, uh, mindfulness uh, to help her with the pain, uh, to tolerate it, and she remained active. So she was a wonderful uh, patient with a chronic condition. Now, I, I haven't seen her in several years. She may very well have had um, lupus flare-ups that led to um, blood work being abnormal again. Uh, but certainly, she, she managed her symptoms much better with this Pathways approach, and well, she felt proud of doing a lot of it herself. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, I'm looking through, through basically, I, I took some notes here. I'm looking at my notes here, and I'm saying, it's like one big yes set. It's like one big, beautiful, under-the-radar yes set with your patients. Um, That's a good <laughs> just, way to look at it. A lot of our <laughs> communication is hypnotic, and yeah. especially if you think about Milton Erickson. And yes, we're looking for how can we, how can we yes and how can the patient yes, <laughs> yes. in their everyday behavior? <laughs> yeah, so no, it is. It's very it, small until you yeah. get a yes. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this. I mean, you, you did mention um, um, adverse childhood experiences because they do um, add up to a lot of chronic illnesses and mental health problems later. Um, how do you address that? I mean, obviously it's within the model, but um, in particular, uh, it doesn't seem like uh, the patient with lupus had any uh, AC, ACEs or adverse chronic, uh, chronic childhood. Or, I would be know. surprised if she didn't, basically, given her condition overall, but they were not, they were not focal in her therapy. They were but not explicit. With a lot of, okay. Yeah. With a lot of patients, they are explicit. Um, one thing I do, and again, I do this usually at, at level two, um, I use um, James Pennybaker's emotional journaling approach. Mm, okay, yeah. Pennybaker has a workbook out on emotional journaling, uh, which is very helpful to the patients, and I encourage the patients to write about their emotions, and it often takes them to painful early experiences. Mm -hmm. Of course, I, I make referrals for psychotherapy, or I do psychotherapy myself, I use hypnosis to revisit traumatic experiences, okay. um, and I use a variety of hypnosis strategies to help people um, to, in a sense, dis distance from, moderate the intensity of the experience so they can integrate the experience in a, in a way that's not re-traumatizing, because I think that's, that's terribly important that we not... Uh, make the mistake that a lot of verbal psychotherapists made over the years of simply talking through things over and over so the patient re-experienced um, autonomic dysregulation and pain, emotional pain. Well, right, so, yeah. And, and I, think so, a lot of, I think a lot of trauma therapies wind up doing that uh, because these are so far back in the developmental history of a, a patient, of a client, and um, they don't, maybe aside from mentalization, they don't really try to integrate uh, a lot. It just gets to the point of like re-traumatizing a patient and, and uh, trying to put a Band-Aid on it without integrating it. Um, but that's just kind of my take on it. Uh, yes, I, I think you're right. And I, when I talk about a chronic illness population, we know that the, the level of um, sexual trauma being violated yeah. uh, in early life is extremely high in the chronic illness population. It's, it's part of what disposes people to chronic illness. So we, we have to assume it's there much of the time, even when the patient doesn't bring it to us explicitly. Right. Have you um, have you had much uh, 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 feedback from people within like rehabilitation psychology circles or health psychology circles about the pathways model? Um, I, health coaches especially like this model. Um, mm -hmm. I I personally have done a lot of work in past years with rehab and uh, pain management, um, but I I don't think we've gotten the book into that. Um, professional audience very well yet. <laughs> so I, I really haven't had much response from those those uh, groups. But I think it's certainly you, you can um, use this model very well with with chronic pain and rehabilitation. 
Now, from my own uh, experience working at a rehab hospital and clinic and pain management clinic as part of that hospital here in Chicago, I see it as a very effective model. And uh, just even reading through the book itself, it's it's very self-explanatory for clinicians. Um, I guess I kind of grokked it pretty well. And thus far, I, I, I would... I think you should use it in connection with the other uh, the other trainings and books that are out there. I think it would be a nice way to kind of sandwich the two or integrate the two together so there's more of this kind of well-rounded approach to it rather than just specifically at looking at the acute experiences of people with rehab issues um, or even cr- I mean, chronic pain, I think, has been approached before, but like... Um, a lot of rehab psychologists, I think, within hospital settings might not have as much of an integrative approach, uh, unfortunately, at least from my yeah. experience. So um, I think it would be a very good thing to, I hope at some point, that this model is uh, in the hands of a lot of rehab psychologists as well and health psychologists. Well, hopefully this podcast will reach some uh, professionals, physical yes. therapists and others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, physical therapists, occupational therapists. Yeah, yeah. One of my um, one of my past uh, dissertation students at Saybrook University was a doctoral already. She was a doctorate in physical therapy, doing a doctorate in mind body medicine, um, and she did a. Um, trying to remember the details, she did a doctoral dissertation on breathing. Um, mm-hmm. She did not explicitly look at. Uh, doing any training in compassion or self-compassion. But she was interested in um, health professionals who were burning out, suffering compassion fatigue. And she got a population of them and just trained them in breathing. And then she studied their um, self-compassion and compassion on questionnaires. And the breathing alone made a huge difference. So we know that a lot of these alternative approaches, such as breathing, uh, can make a tremendous difference at a mind-body level. Oh, um, so when, yeah. You, whether yeah. you're dealing with health professionals or whether you're dealing with people with chronic pain who are stressed out by living with pain and, and being discouraged at the lack of available um, uh, consolation and, and relief. Yeah, I think I think that the health professionals themselves could utilize just a few of these type of things, um, and they should be trained in these as a self uh, self soothing or self medication uh, yes. rather than burning out. Especially now during the COVID era, uh, there's so much of that burnout going on. Um, and also, my contention is that so many of the mechanisms that help people with something like hypnosis outside of the psychodynamics of the hypnosis, but things like mindfulness or or biofeedback. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but a lot of it's just self-regulation tools that uh, balance out the the sympathetic and parasympathetic response to things. Yes, that's a terribly important area right now. And and, and, yeah. and mind-body interventions of any kind, are, I think, are best at that, whether it's hypnosis or biofeedback or some of the uh, somatics therapies. Oh, yeah. Well, any of them. Yoga does the same thing. Yeah. You could even say uh, physical exercise does it. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, you can probably look at heart rate variability before and after weightlifting and, and running and, and see the difference. So, mm-hmm. Well, yeah, it's particularly right. somebody who does these things regularly. Mm-hmm. You're, you're going to yeah. get better um, autonomic function. Yeah. I just real quick follow up here. Um, is there uh, much of an emphasis on psychological testing within any of the three levels of the, like, um, would you do a screener in, in your own practice or a doctor? Yes. Maybe? Yeah. Like well, so. I, I used to do um, a complete battery of psychological tests on everyone I saw. Mm-hmm. Um, I had more and more resistance over the years uh, from insurance uh, to cover yeah. Yeah. extensive evaluation. So over the years, I began to use more um, checklists that I I didn't personally have to pay for, and the patient could do them at home and and hand them to me, and I could score them quickly. So I use the Beck anxiety, the Beck depression. There's a questionnaire that comes out of the Netherlands called the Nijmegen questionnaire, which picks up on um, breathing uh, breathing dysfunction, which contributes to things uh-huh. like anxiety. Uh, so I use that questionnaire a lot and a variety of other checklists. 
Um, so we, Angel often uses um, other more extensive questionnaires, some of which are detailed in the book, um, in both books, actually. So we, mm-hmm. yes, we do start with assessment, and depending on the circumstances, some people come to us and it's self-pay, and um, I'm going to do all of the questionnaires I'll do are going to be free uh, to facilitate their um, access to treatment. Um, sometimes I'll use uh, more extensive particularly if I suspect psych, uh, psychopathology, I'll use more extensive psychological testing. Um, okay, but I think yeah. a, a th- I think we, we need to do a thorough evaluation, again, depending on the presenting problem and w- what we know of the person. And again, and no, sometimes, I think... And, yeah, and sometimes I send them back to their primary care doctor because, um, for example, uh, somebody was referred to me with uh, pain, uh, which had come on rather sudden over a period of about six weeks, Hmm. Um, and in the um, back and upper legs, um, and there had been no extensive medical workup. And the the nurse, the office nurse who made the call to our clinic, mm-hmm. emphasized this person was was kind of anxious and um, depressive, and she thought it was all psychosomatic. Well, it might well have been, uh, but mm-hmm. I sent the patient back to be evaluated, and they found bone cancer. Oh, so goodness, yeah. yeah there good. was a yeah, yeah. suspicious onset because it came on rather quickly. There hadn't been any physical trauma of any kind. Mm-hmm. It just didn't make sense. And the, and then you need a good medical workup. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I, I know that a, a lot of psychiatrists used to do a full medical workup because they were MDs, and then they'd do their yes. psychoanalysis or, or whatnot. But that seems to have gone the way of uh, the dodo with uh, with specialization in our field, yes. so unfortunately. Okay, well, is there anything else you'd like to add, uh, Adan, uh, uh, before we uh, kind of shut down the interview here and, and, and say well, adios for a while? Yeah, I appreciate your time today, Scott. Um, I guess I want to emphasize, it may be obvious in the things I've said, but this is a mind-body-spirit approach to health mm. and well-being. Um, we believe that it's that we can help people at every stage of life. Uh, if a patient comes to me and they have a terminal illness, I still may be able to help their emotional and spiritual well-being, even if I can't alleviate the uh, the cancer that's going to end their life. Um, and I've I've had the wonderful experience of seeing um, terminal patients outlive their. Uh, their medical providers, <laughs> because <laughs> with with a little bit of uh, with a little bit of self efficacy and some improved social supports and some more sense of fulfillment in life, they long outlived their prognosis. <laughs> so I, <laughs> well, I do believe that I, I do believe that we can help people at every stage of life and adjunctive uh, therapies and um, personal lifestyle changes and behavioral skills. All of these things can make an enormous difference. Yeah. Well, thank you for you and Dr. McGrady's work. Much appreciated. I hope that everybody out there in the clinical side of things picks up a copy of this book. And once you get your uh, the patient or the, the client-oriented workbook, I hope that also uh, is available and people look towards guiding their, their own, uh, guiding themselves on their own pathway to health and, uh, and well-being. And when that comes out, just give us a holler and we'll have you back on maybe the oh, two of you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate absolutely. that. Maybe bring Angel with me. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one thing I will mention, my university is now in Pasadena. You mentioned oh. Oakland. <laughs> so well, my, I, my president will be unhappy if I don't correct that. <laughs> ah, okay. I was going to say, I heard, about, I heard a rumor about moving some time ago. So, okay, well, uh, enjoy sunny Pasadena. <laughs> well, unfortunately, I don't think I'm going to see Pasadena for a long time. The, uh, I understand the Rose Bowl was just canceled for January of, of 21. So I well, doubt that I'll be going back to Pasadena soon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> everything we're doing right now is virtual. Everything, yeah. Well, it's a good thing that, that I think Saybrook is integrated on that model and yes. it can run, run. It's doing just fine, I'm sure. Yes, thank you very much, Scott. Take okay, care. take care. Thank you for tuning in. If you like what you heard, do yourself a favor and subscribe to us at iTunes, Spreaker, or your favorite streaming podcast service. And please leave a review. It helps us to know how we're doing. 
All material copyright, the Psychology Talk podcast. Music is provided by the band Serenati.